Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. It's good to see all of you out, and I don't know, as Pastor Sheldon said, I don't know why it always snows on Sunday, but uh, anyway, we'll have to pray about that, right? The Bible does say that the devil is the prince and power of the air. So I don't know how much he meddles with weather or not. But I don't want to get all spooky and weird. But uh, anyway, good to see you out. And we're glad that you braved the elements to be here. Uh, You know, it was a while back. um, Someone sent me an email. And, uh, of course, we all get emails uh, like this. uh, The title of it was, You Know You're Having a Bad Day When. Okay, how many ever had an email like that? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, someone sent it to me. Um, I don't know exactly why. Uh, It seems like I always get those emails when I'm having exactly that, a bad day. So I think the timing was very appropriate. But, you know, this morning I thought I would uh, share with you a few of the things that uh, go in to having a bad day or expressing a bad day. And I thought some of it would be a little bit fun. And so, you know, the, uh, uh, the first one is you know you're having a bad day when you have to hitchhike to the bank in order to make your car payment. How many know that's a bad day? Uh, You know you're having a bad day when the suggestion box at work starts ticking. Okay, so you want to keep your eye on that. You know you're having a bad day when people send your wife sympathy cards on your anniversary. I know that's a a real telltale sign. Uh, You know you're having a day when the pest exterminator crawls under your house and never comes out. Uh, You know you're having a bad day when your children's school calls to tell you that they've surrendered. Okay, and those of you who have kids, you probably could really understand that one. Uh, How about this one? You know you're having a bad day when your wife takes the dog on vacation and leaves you at the kennel. Okay, that's a sure sign that... uh, It's a bad one. How about this? You know you're having a bad day when your plants do better when you don't talk to them. Uh, You know you're having a bad day when your wife wraps your lunch in a road map. Uh, and, And how about this? You know you're having a bad day when you call the suicide prevention line and they put you on hold. And then I like this one. You know you're having a bad day when the birds that are singing outside your window are vultures. Okay. And so those are some of the most common telltale signs that you indeed might be having a very mean, ugly, bad day. And I think we all have those days from na- once in a while, um, bad days. And as much as we hate them and try to stay a million miles away from them, the reality is, is bad days are just part and parcel of what it means to be human and live in this broken world. I mean, bad days are inevitable. And, you know, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Those of you who've been with us for the past several Sundays now, you'll know that we've been moving through a series of messages we've entitled Thrive. That's been the name, Thrive. Don't just survive, but Thrive. And we began this series by looking at when God created this thing called life. Uh, He just didn't do a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, But rather when it came time for God to unleash His life and light here on earth, I mean, He pulled out all the stops and He created what the Bible calls life and life more abundantly. That kind of life. Life and life more abundantly. And of course, because God created that kind of life, His desire is that all of us would learn to experience it and walk in it more and more in our everyday existence. That is called thriving. Thriving life. And so that's how we began the series. And then, of course, we moved on to the second message, which talked about thriving and disappointment. Um, that we realize that there are some things in life that don't turn out the way we had prayed and planned and hoped, but that regardless of the size and toxicity of that disappointment, God enables us to rise above them and and thrive even in that disappointing place. 
Uh, and then those of you who were with us last week, you'll know that I shared a message entitled Thriving in Relationship, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I gave you four kind of practical things we all can do to see that our relationships stay as healthy and robust and strong as God intended them to be. That's where we've been so far in the series. And uh, what I'd like to do this morning is actually wrap this series up by sharing the fourth and last message in it. This is the last message. It's one I call Thriving in Adversity, Thriving in the Bad Days, Thriving when things aren't going well at all, when all hell is broke loose. How many of you know God wants us to thrive in that very place? Amen? And so uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to look at a portion of Scripture there. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Revelation, you'll know that simply summed up, it's a book that uncovers. That's really what it does. In fact, the very word revelation means to disclose, to reveal, to expose. And that's exactly what this book does. It takes the lid off a lot of stuff. Uh, It reveals the identity of Jesus, that he isn't just a babe in a manger. Um, but he is the soon coming king, right? It reveals his identity. It reveals the a- uh, rapture of the church, the battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, those are some of the things that are contained in the book of Revelation. And it's certainly not my intention to preach all of it this morning. Okay, how many are thankful for that? Although I did break my watch. It came off my wrist this morning. And so I really don't know what time it is. Right. So anyway, pray, okay? Pray the Lord give me wisdom and direction in all of this. It's not my intention to preach all of the book, but I do want to focus in on one particular part. It's found here in Revelation 1, uh, verse 9. Okay, It says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And so right off the bat, the writer here begins to reveal to us exactly who he is. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion. In other words, the person who wrote this book is John, and the John that we're talking about is none other than the Apostle John. It's the same John who wrote one of the Gospels out of the four. It's that John. It's also the same John who wrote three of the epistles in the New Testament. That is the author. And as he writes, he begins to share with us not only who he is, but he begins to tell us exactly the location in which he had found himself. And let me say that it's not exactly the most pleasant and comfortable kind of setting. And you see it here. It says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in tribulation. In tribulation. Let's say that together. In tribulation. One translation says it like this, I, John, your partner with you in suffering. Another one says, I, John, your brother with you in trouble. Another one says, I, John, your brother and close companion in life's trials. And you know, that is the place John had found himself in, smack dab in the middle of a very dark and painful place, banished as a prisoner on the barren island of Patmos. That was the place he was living when he wrote this. But you know, what I find interesting is that although John was living in that place, a very difficult and trying place, he also found himself in another kind of place. And this is what I find so fascinating about this verse. And you see it here. It says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. It says, in the tribulation and in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And you know, I don't know about you, but when I read that, it's like something went off inside of me. And how many know, sometimes scripture will do that in us. That's why they call the Bible a living word. And when I was reading this, it's like something went off inside of me. And I began to see that it's possible for us to live in two very different and distinct places at exactly the same time. 
Two places at the same time. One of those places is the place of adversity and pain. In fact, that, that is the place John had found himself. He, he, he flat out calls it the place of tribulation. That is one of the places John had, had, had been living. But as we see here this morning, that was not the only place John was living in. But that there was another. And that other was also smack dab in the very middle and center of God's kingdom and will for his life. And he said that here. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I find that fascinating that John was in both those places at the same time in tribulation and in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that tells me is, is it tells me that we, just like John, can find ourselves living in the very same two places at exactly the same time. That we can be in a place of great difficulty and trials. And how many here have ever found yourself in that place? Okay. I mean, all of us have. You might be in that place today. You might have a week like that. You might actually have a whole month like that, a place of great difficulty and trial, a place of adversity and pain and suffering and heartache. We can find ourselves living in that place. And yet the interesting thing is that we can also be at the very center of God's kingdom and will for our lives. In tribulation and in the kingdom, and that's what I call thriving in adversity. Thriving in adversity. And so this morning, I want you to think about where you might be at right now in your life. Okay, let's just do some self-reflection. Because I think if some of us were to be honest with ourselves, we'd have to admit, man, this has been a very hard season for me. It's kind of like what Philip, our worship leader, was saying. Some of us are going through some very difficult and trying times. You know, it might be the fact that uh, the bottom has fallen out of our finances. That can be a crushing place. Uh, It could be maybe our business isn't as doing as well as we had hoped. That can be a very difficult place. Uh, It could have to do with our health. It's not what it should be. Or our marriage is under attack. Or our family is going through some real monster-sized storms. Or maybe it's just a whole lot of inner turmoil that's been going on inside of us. I want you to think about what the particular place might be for you when it comes to this whole area of adversity. Because all of us find ourselves in that place. And you know, sometimes when we do, and I want you to hear me this morning, sometimes when we find ourselves in the hard place, we begin to believe the lie that God doesn't care about me. That God isn't listening to my prayers. That God is a million miles away. That God is as loving. He's not as faithful. He's not as kind as the Bible says He is. Because if He really was, then I wouldn't be going through all this junk in my life right now. Sometimes we can begin to believe that. That we've been forgotten and abandoned by God in the hard place. And yet we need to give our heads a shake and remind ourselves nothing could be further from the truth. And that just like John here, we can find ourselves actually living in two places at exactly the same time. That we can be in the place of tribulation, but also in the very center of God's kingdom and will for our lives. And that's what I call thriving in adversity. And so what I want to do this for the rest of our time this morning, is I want to just share with you some things we can do that will really help us adjust and grow in that place. How many here you're interested in growing? Okay. Sometimes we grow best in the hard place. And so I want to give you a few things that will help you do that. But before we do, turn to the person next to you and tell them it's about to get better. Just tell them that. About to get better. You know the first thing when it comes to thriving in adversity, this is the first thing we can do, okay, Um, is relax because it's normal, okay, relax. Okay, so I want us just to take a deep breath right now. Let's just breathe in and let's just breathe out. Okay, relax. Sometimes it's hard to relax, right, especially when you're in the place of adversity, it's really hard to relax. You know, I think we're all familiar with the story of... uh, 
the little hen called Chicken Little. How many heard that one? You know, it's a nursery rhyme, I think it is. Chicken Little, one day she's out walking through the woods as she's making her way through the trees. Suddenly an acorn breaks loose from the branch, hits her on the head. Ah! Right? And, you know, rather than just relaxing, because I think poor Chicken Little had a hard time with relaxation, rather than relaxing and taking a nice deep chicken breath, Right? Relax and, and breathe and, and evaluate and assess the situation. She immediately flies into a, a frenzy, comes to the conclusion that the sky is falling, the world is about to come to an end, and then she runs out of the woods and tells all her friends, pastes it on her Facebook page. And that's how she responded. You know, there's a name for that. There's a name for that condition. It's called the Chicken Little Syndrome. Okay, and the, re- and the reason why I mention it this morning is because tragically it doesn't affect chickens only, but that sometimes as humans we can suffer from it as well. And I'm speaking from experience. We can suffer from it. And one of the main ways uh, a person can tell if they might have this syndrome is to, to watch what you are like whenever the acorns and the bumps and the difficulties and trials of life hit you on the head. Okay? What are you like? Do you, do, do, do you go into a flap and a fuss? Do you worry and fret? Do you get your little chicken knickers in a knot? I just had to say that. What are you like? I want you to think about it. When you find yourself in the middle of a difficult time, how do you respond? Are you able to, uh, do you get in a frenzy or are you able to take a step back, rest, relax, trust and let go because you know that the problems and the adversities that you are going through right now are just part and parcel of what this thing called life is all about. It's just normal. It's normal. It's normal. And that's exactly what 1 Peter 4.12 says. He says, my dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. In other words, what Peter is saying is don't get surprised and astonished. Don't pull a chicken little when your life turns in a negative way because Peter is saying that it's just normal, it's just natural, it's just this thing called life. And that there'll always be times of pain, always. There'll always be times of adversity. There'll always be seasons of testing. And so rather than allowing them to take control of us, we need to just take two steps back, relax, and give it to a God who loves us more than we love ourselves. In tribulation and in the kingdom. Thriving in adversity. That's the first thing, right? Is relax because it's normal. You know, the second thing is rejoice because it's purposeful. Purposeful. And I know sometimes it's hard for us to believe. To believe that all the difficulties and pain that we go through in life really does have a purpose to it. A far deeper meaning to it. It's hard for us to believe that. And yet the fact is it really does. That all the trials that we face in life are in fact, and I want you to hear me, they are in fact the very thing God uses to change and transform us from the inside out. Adversity is the very tools of God. And because of that, because of that, when we know that, when we understand there's a purpose for trials, we can be far more thankful and joyful in the midst of it. We really can. And of course, that's exactly what Peter says. Let's read this verse again. He says, My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. You might be here saying, Well, how can you do that? I mean, how can you not think it's strange? How can you not think it's unusual? Well, Peter tells us in the very next verse, he says, Instead, be what? Be what? Say that again? Be very glad. Notice he doesn't say just be glad. 
It's a higher level of gladness. I call it a higher level of joy. He says, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. That is the purpose of adversity. And that's why we can be glad in the midst of it. I love how the message translation puts this verse. It says, instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of it with Christ. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. Glory just around the corner. I love that. Peter tells us that all the adversity and and, and the garbage and junk that we go through in life is simply part of a spiritual refining process. One that carries with it the promise of glory just around the corner. And so because of that, because we know that, because we know our trials and testings are in fact doing a deeper work of change and transformation and refining and purifying inside of us, we can learn to be far more thankful and joyful in the very midst And so, you know, a sure sign, and I want you to hear me this morning, a sure sign that you are in both tribulation and the kingdom, okay? Be ashamed to just live in tribulation, right? That's a terrible place to live. But a sure sign that you're living in both places, in tribulation and in the kingdom, in, 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 in thriving in adversity, is when is how do you respond when your life turns upside down? What is your response? Now, I want you just to think about that. Okay? Wives, don't poke your husbands right now. Okay? Just... What do you respond like when things aren't going well? What do you respond like when you have more bills than income? What do you respond like when someone hurts and offends you? What do you respond like when all the wheels seem to fall off your life and you find yourself in the middle of a perfect storm? What do you respond like if you respond in ways that are other than rejoicing? Then you might have to assess and say, well, I'm not really thriving in adversity. Because one sure sign that we are in the kingdom and in adversity is we're able to Be joyful in the midst of it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that's the way it is. And that's why James says in 1, 2, he says, Consider it a sheer gift, a sheer gift. Christmas is around the corner. Well, this is talking about a gift, a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of it prematurely if you can't say amen to that say oh me let it do its work so you'll become mature well developed not deficient in any way okay that's what this verse is talking about it's talking about rejoicing in the midst of a hard time of a testing time of a place of adversity and the only way we can do that I want you to hear me, is when we are able to see that all the pain that we are experiencing is doing a far deeper work of change and transformation inside of us. It's developing us and making us more mature. And so the next time all hell breaks loose in your life, you find yourself right in the middle of a perfect storm Rather than doing the chicken little flap, okay? And I, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. I mean, rather than doing the chicken little flap, going around telling everyone the sky is falling, I'll tell you, convert your flap into a song. Are you with me? Did you hear that this morning? Convert, convert your flap into a song. Convert your fear into faith and learn to have victory. Do a victory dance in the middle of your hard time. Amen? Turn to the person next to you and say, this isn't bad stuff. Just tell them that. Thriving in adversity. You're in the kingdom. You're in tribulation, but you're in the kingdom. And so uh, relax because it's normal. Rejoice because it's purposeful. You know, the third one is reach out because it's helpful. Helpful. Okay? And I want to just sort of camp on this one for a little while. That your junk is helpful. 
helpful not only to you but to others. You know, it was just the other day I happened to come across an article entitled Amazing Art Made from Junk. That was the title of the web page. And just like the title suggested, it, 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 was, it was full. It was a website full of all kinds of beautiful works of art um, that were actually made out of household junk. Art made from junk. And you'd be surprised at how much money they were selling this stuff for. I thought, man, if I ever needed to get a new hobby, it'd be one of these. And so, you know, I just happen to have some of the pieces here. I mean, uh, here's one. Here's... Uh, Here's an owl made from junk, if you like owls, um, made from junk. You know, here's, uh, here's another one. Um, this is a dog made from all kinds of uh, milk caps and, and things like that um, that sold, I think, for a couple of hundred thousand. I don't know. I mean, just crazy stuff. You know, here's one. Um, this, is, uh, this is Michael Jackson made from an old cassette tape. How many think that's pretty neat? What would even be neater is if that was, you know, one of his songs right there on the tape. But anyway, I don't know. But that, that's a neat piece of art. And then, of course, you know, here's one. Here's, uh, here's a monkey, right, a big gorilla uh, made out of coat hangers. And so uh, how many think that would look good right in the entrance of your house, you know? <laughs> Man, the burglars come in. That'll keep them away for sure. But that, that piece of art is made out of coat hangers. And then, of course, th this one is just a whole bunch of different junk. And they've made Albert Einstein out of it. How many think that's pretty neat? I thought that was pretty awesome that you could take junk and make works of art and beauty out of them. You might say, well, why are we talking about that? Well, the reason why I'm talking about it is because that's exactly what God does in our lives. That God takes all the hurt and the pain. He takes the sins and the mistakes, all the garbage and junk we go through in life. And he actually turns it into beautiful art that not only is there to help beautify and strengthen our lives, but also other lives as well. Our adversity is very helpful. And, you know, I want to show you this. There's a, a portion of Scripture that talks a lot about this. It's found in 2 Corinthians 1.3, and I don't want to spend too much time. And I know we're going through a lot of Scripture this morning, but, hey, I mean, I only get one kick at the can with you guys once a week, and so I really feel we need to just get into the Word when it comes to finding out what the Bible says about adversity. And so 2 Corinthians 1.3, Paul starts off here. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. The Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. I just love that. You know, I love the fact that Paul, when it comes time to describe what God is like, I love the fact that he chooses the word mercy and comfort, mercy and comfort, Father of mercy, God of all comfort. I love that because I know there's a whole lot of other words Paul could have picked. He could have called him the God of all power because God is exactly that. He's all powerful. He could have called him the God of all wisdom because we know God is all wise. He could have called him the God of all justice, the God of all holiness, the God of purity and truth because God is all those things. And yet when it came time for Paul to describe what God is like, he chose to call him the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Father of mercies, God of all comfort. And I love how the Amplified Bible puts this verse. It says, Father of sympathy and God who is the source of every comfort. God is the source of all our comfort. In other words, He's the very wellspring, the fountainhead of all comfort. And because of that, we can turn to Him in our times of deep adversity and pain. We can turn to Him. And that's exactly what Paul says. He says, who comforts us in how many of our tribulations? What does he say? All our tribulations, that's the big ones and the widow ones, right? That's the easy ones and the hard ones. It's all our tribulation. God comforts us in all our tribulations. And you know, this word tribulation is an interesting word. It's actually a picture word that means pressing together like the crushing of grapes. Wow. You say, sounds like my life story, man. 
pressing together like the crushing of grapes. And I think all of us have had times in our life where we felt just like that. We felt like things are so difficult. My life is so pressurized. I mean, there are so many problems and hassles going on in my life right now. I feel like I'm living in a wine press. And that it's squeezing the very strength and hope and faith right out of me. I mean, we can find ourselves in that place. And yet Paul says that when we do, that's when God wants to come and give us a dose an impartation of His comfort. He comforts us in all our tribulations. I mean, what a wonderful promise. Getting comfort in the midst of our difficult seasons. You know, that is in tribulation and in the kingdom. Right? That's when you're in tribulation, but you're experiencing the glory of the kingdom, the promises of the kingdom. But what I want you to realize is that the ultimate goal in all of this is not for us just to find strength and comfort in God ourselves. It's not just for us alone. But rather, one of the main reasons why God brings comfort and strength and grace to us in our crushing time of need is so that in turn we can take that comfort and then get up and begin to share it with those around us who are suffering in our lives. That is called reaching out. And that's exactly what Paul says here. He says in verse 4, he says here that um, who comforts us in all our tribulations. Why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the same comfort in which we were comforted by God ourselves. Okay, and I want you to hear me this morning. One of the main reasons why God allows us to go through dark times, seasons of adversities, testings and trials and difficulties and pain. It's not because he likes to see us suffer. I mean, it's not like he's a sadomasochist up there in the sky somewhere. That's not it at all. The reason why God lets us go through hard times is because he is hoping that when we are in it, we will reach out to him and receive his comfort and grace and be strengthened. And then having done that, we would take the same strength and comfort that we have received from him and reach out to those around us who need it as well. And so that's one of the main benefits adversity brings into our lives. It makes us far more qualified and equipped to help and minister to others. And so I want you to think about that. I mean, who is better equipped to reach out and help a person facing the trauma and pain of divorce than someone who has walked through that same pain themselves? And so you might be here, you might have suffered the pain of divorce. You might feel like you are on the sidelines now. You might feel like, well, I'm not important in, 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 in the kingdom of God, in the, in the things of God. Well, you need to see, understand, if you've gone through that and come out the other side, have been healed and restored, I mean, you are a valuable, valuable asset in the hands of God. He can use you to minister to others who are experiencing that very pain themselves. I mean, who is more capable to help and support someone who's struggling with the pain of addiction and destructive habits than someone who has faced it and conquered it themselves? Right? I mean, who is more qualified to help someone face the heartache of a financial crisis or the loss of a loved one or the breakup of their family? Who is better? qualified than someone who has been through the darkness themselves, received the strength and comfort of God, and then gone on to the other side of it. Who is better? And that's why it's so important that whenever we find ourselves in a dark and difficult place, which we do many times, it's so important that we don't just retreat and pull back and focus only on ourselves. And, you know, that, that, that's easy to do. I know it. When you're going through a hard time, it's so easy to just look into yourself. Forget about those around you. You look into yourself thinking, it's all about me, my problems, my pain, my hurt, my suffering, my misfortune, my messed up life. 
And whenever we get into that downward cycle, it's so important that we give ourselves a shake and remind ourselves that our pain and the garbage that we go through is not about us alone. But rather, God wants to take the garbage, work it into our lives. So after we are on the other side, we can begin to reach out and minister to others. Amen? And so um, that's how you stay in the kingdom and in the adverse place at the same time. Using your pain to minister to others. I don't want to spend a lot of time, although my watch is broken, so I have no clue what time it is. But, uh, um, you know, I want you to think about somebody this week you might be able to reach out to. I mean, think of the, the, the word that Philip had this morning. Philip, our worship leader. What did he say? He said, I feel that there's somebody. He was in prayer. He said, I feel there's somebody who God is calling to, to step out, but because they feel so overwhelmed, they're holding back. I think this is a specific word for many of us this morning. And so you think about that. And so, you know, we thrive in adversity when we can relax because it's normal, rejoice because it's purposeful, reach out because it's helpful. You know, the last one, and we're going to close up, is refocus because it's temporal. Okay, and I don't know about you, but one of the easiest things for me to do when I begin to walk through, when I have to face a a, a particularly long, intense time of of adversity and pain, is to just want to throw in the towel and give up. I mean, that's the greatest temptation for me and no doubt for you. I mean, we just want to give up. That we get into a dark place and, 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 and after a while we get our eyes so fixed on all the problems and the hurt and the hassle and all the things that aren't working out in our lives that after a while that's all we see are those things. You know, I remember a couple of years ago, we faced sort of a flurry of challenging things. It all started uh, in, you know, we were biking around the Glenmore Loop and we'd made some mistakes. We put our little dog in the basket of the bike, of Clarice's bike, because he loves Clarice, our little dog. He's about this big, right? He's more like a gopher than a dog. So we put him in the basket of the bike I knew he wouldn't want to stay with me, but he loves Clarice, so he's in the basket of the bike. We're biking around Glenmore Loop, going down a hill, and then all of a sudden he gets this brilliant idea. And that idea was that he didn't like it in the basket of the bike, especially going down a hill at 50 miles an hour. And he jumped out of the basket of the bike. Well, of course, when he jumped out, Clarice went like this to miss him. She didn't want to run over the poor little guy. <coughs> and when she turned her, 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 her bike, she flipped over. And, I mean, she, she broke her wrist it really, really bad. I mean, many of you, you know, you heard the story. And so we had to call an ambulance and they had to come down the bike path and she went to the hospital and, you know, spent the night and they, they, they performed surgery on her. Very painful. And then two weeks later, you know, she's starting to heal up. Pain's still there, but starting to heal. We go back to the doctor for a checkup and the doctor said, oh, I have some bad news. It never sat right. It shifted. They put pins in it, but it shifted. We have to break it again. And do it all over again. I'm thinking, man, oh man, it's bad enough first time. Now we got to do it a second time. And so, you know, she goes through that operation again. And I mean, she can't use her hand, right? It's her right hand. So, you know, I I challenge you to tie your hand up, your dominant hand, for, for, for 20, for do it for three hours and see how you do. You know, how do you brush your, how do you get dressed? You know, how do you get undressed? I mean, how do you live? I mean, that's what she was like. And so, you know, after a a month went by, she still got her hand in a cast. You know, she's driving my car because she can't drive her car because her car is a standard and my car is an automatic. My beautiful car (laughs) that was given to me as a gift from a dear friend. Top of the line Acura, everything fully loaded, just a beautiful car. She's driving it. It's not her fault. And there she is in the Walmart parking lot. What can happen in the parking lot of a Walmart? Big, massive truck turns right into my car. (laughs) And when it's all said and done, both wheels are just bent like this. 
I think, well, you know, they probably just popped out of their riggings. They just put them back in. They tow it away. The insurance company evaluates it. It's a total write-off. Well, you say, you always get a new car. Yeah, but it was a special car. It was a car that was given to me by a friend of mine who now went home to be with the Lord. I love that car. I'm not blaming Clarice now, okay? But I mean, here we go. Now my car's wrecked, right? I've got to buy a new car. And then like three days after that, I, Clarice walks out of the house and she goes to get into to, to, to our other car and there's glass all over the driveway. She thinks, what's this? And then she looks and, and, and the windshield's all smashed. And I guess someone came in the middle of the night. They saw our GPS and that's why never leave your GPS. That's what she told me for three months after that. Never leave your GPS in your car because someone could break in and steal it. And they did. They stole my GPS, but they were in such a hurry. They left the cord behind. I felt like putting an ad in the Herald. You stole my GPS. You forgot the cord. Let's meet and get things together. So, I mean, there it is. Like, I mean, in, in less than two months, I mean, accident and surgeries and smash my car and lose my, my GPS. And I thought, man, am I in hell or what? Now, what did I do? Did I make God mad? Like, do, do I have all the very forces of, of, of heaven against me or what? No, no, not at all. I mean, that's just in tribulation, tribulation and in the kingdom. And so I can choose, if I'm in tribulation, whether to live in the kingdom, but the choice is mine. And that's why it's so important when we get into a difficult place, we learn how to refocus. And that's exactly what Paul says here. He says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And you know, when you read this, you can't help but wonder, how was Paul able, ever able to live his life like this? I mean, to be able to face such intense trials and adversities, and yet never once allowing it to stop him or cause him to quit. How could he do that? Well, I'll tell you, the whole key is in this area of right focus. And of course, he says that in a few verses down. He says, for our present Troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Paul says that my troubles, as difficult and as as intense as they are, they are small. They won't last. In fact, one translation says it like this. These hard times are but small potatoes compared to the good times and the lavish celebrations that God has prepared for us. You know, I just love that. Paul says that these hard times are are, are but small potatoes, just little stuff compared to the awesome, glorious things that God has for my life, both now and hereafter. That is what I call refocusing. It's choosing to believe that regardless of what we go through in life, how hard it is, how difficult it may be, I'll tell you from God's perspective, it's just small potatoes. It's small potatoes compared to the blessing and celebration, the glory and grace, the victory and triumph that He has prepared for us. And so that's why focusing is so important. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I get into a place... I don't know what it's like for you where I begin to focus on the problems more than the Lord. You know, I I, I start focusing on the problems and, and before you know it, those problems are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? You know what it's like? You think about this thing and that thing and this bill and that bill and that situation. They get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it's almost like God. The problems become monstrous and God becomes miniature. It's like, honey, I shrunk the Lord. 
I shrunk. The, how'd you shrink them? I mean, how do you shrink God? Well, I shrunk them because I was focused on all the wrong things, right? I was focused on all the things that weren't working. Well, that's why it's so important that we, we, we keep everything in proper perspective, realizing that regardless of what we go through in life, they are just small potatoes, small potatoes, light stuff compared to the awesome things that God has for us. Amen. And so that's how you thrive in adversity. That's how you live both in tribulation and in the kingdom, right? You learn how to rest and relax because you know it's normal. You learn how to uh, rejoice and be thankful because you know it's purposeful. It's doing something inside of you, right? You learn how to reach out and minister to others because you know that your junk is the very thing they need to be helped and find comfort themselves. And then you learn how to refocus over and over again. And that refocusing thing, maybe that's a daily thing. You know, maybe that's a minute by minute thing. But you refocus and you put your attention on the majesty and the goodness and the graciousness of a God who loves us more than we love ourselves. And I'll tell you, you do that. That's when the victory of God begins to take root in your heart. And it begins to break out, not only in our lives, but the lives of others. Amen. And so, you know, I want us to stand uh, this morning because when you think, when you talk about small potatoes, you know, I turned on the news this weekend, like many of you. I was just shocked at what's going on in the Philippines. The devastation, we don't even know yet the extent of it. 